one of the things that, that, that my job is to try and find out well, which of the things that are out there in the marketplace are, are most important for the Irish government's investment to be used. To pick out some of the ones that we've identified as being the, 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 the things that we want to focus on with, with the research project and to share with you some of the outputs from that work and hopefully again to, to give you things to take away in terms of ideas that, that you can either uh, take right into your organizations but probably more likely start a conversation with ourselves in terms of the things that are going to be relevant to you and how we can help you both as the the ILA let's say and, and, and my role but also the companies what are the things that we can we can bring into your organizations going forward so in the past I would have had to spend a bit of time in my presentations introducing the technologies and web 2.0 and, and and the sort of uh, the changes that have been going on but to be honest guys you've, you've seen an awful lot of this stuff today so I'm not going to dwell on any of these tools, um, only to say that the sheer number of them is just pretty you know, uh, staggering, and to be honest, it's pretty scary. Um, but it's also the growth that I just can't really get my head around. So globally, 5 million new people are signed up with, with uh, Facebook every month. I mean, it's, it's just quite, a, you know, it's, it's mind-blowing. But what's worse is, it's actually per week. Okay, so that's five million people. They're finding five million people every week who, ha who aren't on Facebook yet. So that's a good start. Um, uh, but, but I was amazed to hear Tony talking about his mother. Like, you know, I mean, my mother's certainly not going anywhere near Facebook yet. But, but it, it, it's the, the, there's the, the, the growth is just incredible. Um, the other one is, I'm sure at this stage, based on both President Obama's campaign and, and the Hudson uh, River crash, we've all heard of Twitter, right? Um, now, I will talk to you a little bit about how I've used Twitter for the, for the, for to put these presentations together, but I'm not quite in the Twitter fanatic camp yet. But it, it's one of those things that's just exploded out there. And the only thing I know about this number is the number for 2009 is going to blow this one out because this was before Obama and the Hudson River and everything. So, I mean, I, I got uh, stuff yesterday is that Baby Gap is following me on Twitter. And I'm thinking, OK, I only bought something for my kids in Gap like an hour ago, and now they're following me on Twitter? They're going to be pretty bored, right? Because all I, all I tweet about is this kind of stuff, and I don't do it very regularly. So I can just imagine some poor person in Baby Gap whose job is to monitor the <laughs> Twitter feeds. They're going to be excited by my talk about today's activities or whatever. Um, but it's all out there. And I think the thing that we've tried to do is say, OK, if people have these devices, because this is the other big shift. So there's the likes of Facebook and Twitter and the explosive growth there. But the other huge shift for me in the last 12 months is that with the 3G iPhone and then everything else that's come since, we now have multimedia devices that we can use for, for real learning experiences you know, pretty much anywhere, anytime. And this has been something we've talked about in the industry for a long, long time. I remember a device Apple was going to bring out about 15 years ago that was going to deliver this. But it's taken 15 years, but we now have tools in terms of hardware that can actually deliver the content to people wherever they are, literally at the point of need. So there's a couple of huge shifts that's happened even in the last 12 to, to 18 months, I think, are changing the way we can deliver things today. Um, I'm not quite sure we've gone this far. And it's great that you, you can tell that, that we did a little bit of preparation uh, as speakers, but I hadn't realized that the Matrix script was going to be in there in Tony's talk. So it's definitely becoming embedded in our lives, if not yet embedded in our bodies. Um, so the challenge we have is that if, if people are embedding these tools and technologies in our lifestyles, how do we embed them in the workplace? And that's really the challenge we've taken on board is to try and work out how can we embed these tools in the workplace? Because it is a workplace where the millennials expect these tools. And some of the things we'll talk about, we all know that it's not as easy to give them these tools today, but they expect them. But I think the bigger challenge is for everybody else in the organization. And right now they could do with a spare pair of hands because times are difficult. So what we need to do is we need to find a set of tools that the millennials expect, but that everybody else can embrace. Because if we can't get all the generations using these tools, we're not going to get the full value from it. If only that small percentage of, of the organization that use these all the time outside of work is using them, you're not getting that, that true you know, knowledge sharing and collaboration. We talked earlier about the baby boomers leaving the organization. Well, if, if you're forcing them to sit down and, you know, but listen, before you go out the door, can you just dump everything that you know into this wiki page, you know, that's not going to happen very well because that's everything I know, you know, it's, that's, that's, that's my life just down there. Whereas what you need to do is you need to give them the tools that they can really enjoy and embrace using as well, as much, just as much as the younger generation. So for me, the, the, the graphic on the left, which is the people connected by technology, that's kind of important, but it's the graphic on the right, as you're looking at it, that's more important, okay? Because what these tools do 
is it enables those people to connect. It enables them to collaborate and to communicate. But where the real value from those social interactions comes from is the other thing that we've been talking about all day, which is the context. Okay? So it's those people who provide the context. And that the technology does is it's enabled this to happen. So this is the key, and you'll see the theme that we've been, we've been focusing on is that context is we think where the real value will come from these tools. And value is important because it's, it's always been the same, but it's even more so now. We need to do more with less. And I think that's what everybody's been talking about is, is this cannot be something that relies on a huge, significant technology investment that the IT people have to plan on for years or whatever. It's not like rolling out an ERP system. It's not like even you know, the, the LMS kind of rollout. It's got to be something that can be supported by the existing tools. Um, obviously, there's some new tools needed and required, but that, that it's not, you're not talking about replacing everything you've already got. It's trying to build things around the systems that you have in-house. But it's not going to be easy, OK? I think what we heard today was some great ideas and some wonderful things that might happen in the future. And we can see the blue sky out there. But being from Ireland, we're well used to bumps in the road. Um, I think Tony's, he had the cowpath story before we prepared for today. So it wasn't put in there specially for, for me for today. But, but the idea that we're going on a journey and, and we, can, we can see that there's going to be some bumps in the road. This is where we fo focused our research on. So what are those bumps and what can we do to try and smooth the path for everybody as we travel along that journey? Because the other thing I know is this, th there's going to be a backlash to this, OK? You, we've all been there. We've all come up with, I've just come back from the conference with the next big thing. And this is going to transform our organization. And, and then maybe you even get people to commit to it. And you try it out. And those little things start to go wrong. And then everybody starts to, everyone starts screaming. The IT people, the legal people, whoever it is, people are going to start screaming. So again, these are the bumps that we're talking about, the barriers to success. If we can try and identify what they are and try and help you to address them, hopefully it'll be a smoother journey. Um, and there's nothing new in this. I think Tony mentioned the Gartner. How many, hands up, how many people have heard of the Gartner hype cycle? Um, very, very interesting. In fact, uh, somebody did one on e-learning a few years ago. We could probably do another one now. But the basic concept is that any new technology that's introduced, think of the web itself, OK? So think back to 99, 2000. You're going up the hype curve, right? Then what happens is we hit the bubble bursts, and you get this huge, huge kind of crash into the trough of disillusionment. It's a great, it's a great phrase, right? When this backlash happens, we want to be ready for that, and we want to try and smooth out this curve so that we can actually give people a smoother path going forward. So what we've done, and again, we're not alone in all of this. There's a lot of companies who started doing this stuff. And then there are other companies who follow those kind of processes. So the, that's why we brought the guys from Burson in. You know, Al wouldn't have had a chance to go through all of the examples. But it, this is an example from the McKinsey Quarterly. And the figure is like the 22% of the companies that were surveyed around using Web 2.0 at work, 2 at work said that it hadn't worked. Uh, they were di they were deep, deep, deep dissatisfaction, I think, was the, the category on the, on the form. And that some of them said, we're not going to go back to that. So I'm not saying that that is the case. What I am saying is, let's try and find out why it didn't work. Okay? And that's in the same report. And I'm sure anecdotally you can share these ideas. Let's try and find the things that people are saying didn't work and try and address those. And these are some of the key ones. Okay? So this is the things that we're going to show you, things that we're working on. And the first one is, oh no, listen guys, right now we just can't deal with another new technology. Okay? It's just not the right time. Please go away and leave us alone, OK? The second one is, I think Tony called it info glut, but it's the information overload. There's just way too much stuff there, and I don't have time to be dealing with this right now. Then we have the accuracy of data. How do we know it's correct? If we're just letting people put stuff up, how do we know they're saying the right things? And the security of data. We talked about it ourselves. If people are putting you know, compliance or um, secret stuff up there, you know, how do we control that? And then the other question, you know, is how to measure value. So you can hear why I, when you were talking about things earlier on, I was, I was glad we were hearing the same kind of uh, topics coming up because these are the kind of things that we think are really, really important. And what I want to do now is just show you some of the things we're doing to hopefully address these barriers. <laughs>